ask a question. How many of you have asthma? Any of you have asthma? Or how many of you have had asthma and now you don't have it anymore? Okay, that's me. I used to have I asthma. Vegan. When I went to a plant diet, it became a lot of time. Well, say that again? When I went to a plant diet, it became a lot and that's when I lost my asthma. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, there you go. That's a promotion for a Daniel challenge right there. <laughs> um, when I was, uh, I think I contracted asthma when I was about 18 months old. If I, if, well, I don't remember, it was what my mom says. But I had a really bad case of asthma. And I'll never forget, every, um, every Thursday, I had to go to this hospital in Los Angeles. It's the uh, LA USC Medical Center. In fact, it's that hospital. My mom used to watch a soap opera called General Hospital. And on General Hospital, they would have, this is back in the 70s, they would have this um, picture of a hospital. Well, that's the hospital I used to go to. And I used to go there every Thursday to get a shot on this arm and a shot on that arm. You know, in those days, they give you epinephrine. Um, I remember having to go to an emergency and get a shot when my uh, inhalers didn't work. Uh, they just give you a shot of epinephrine and your asthma just disappeared, but your heart would be dancing a million miles an hour. They don't do that anymore. But um, my mom, one day when I had to go to the hospital, for some reason she had to leave and so she actually dropped me off. I was about 12 or 13 years old living in Los Angeles. She had something to do, I don't remember. So she dropped me off and um, what she did was she arranged a uh, she arranged a one of these dial a ride deals. And I'll never forget, it was a blue van with big yellow lettering. I'll never forget that, because I've seen them before. Uh, so after my, my uh, after they murdered me with these shots, I go outside and I'm looking for this dial a ride. My mom said it's gonna be in this place at a certain time. And I kept on waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and it never showed up. It just never was there. 12 or 13 years old. So I decided to walk home. You got it right. I decided to walk home. Now my mom would take the streets sometimes from our house to the hospital, or she would, uh, uh, or she'd take the freeway. Well, I couldn't walk in the freeway, so I was 95% sure of the way home on the streets. So um, I check it out on Google Maps. It's roughly eight miles or so. And so I started walking home. Now in those days, we didn't have any cell phones. I didn't know where my mom was, so no phone call was made by me to my mom. So I started walking home past this Multnomah Street. There was Wilson High School in El Sereno over there. Walked down this street, Figueroa, all the way to Eagle Rock, where our house was. And I was walking home and home. It was the only way I knew. It was the only way I knew to go home. Um, my mom, of course, was deathly worried about me. And I remember when I got home. Actually, I don't remember. This is what she tells me. When I got home, I knocked on the door. And she opened the door. And she was just in pieces, as you can imagine. She was in tears. She, her eyes were all swollen. She had called the dial ride. She was bawling them out and calling the police. I mean, she was doing all that she can. She, for all she knew, she probably thought I was dead. But um, you can imagine, just imagine you moms, how you must feel, how you thought your child was gone forever, and then he shows up. So uh, anyways, but it was, the only, it was the only road that I knew, it was the only way that I knew to get home. You know what Jesus said one day to his listeners? He actually said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he said. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus affirmed not only his identity when he was on earth as the Son of God, as he used to uh, like to call himself the Son of Man, but he clearly and bluntly stated that he is the way to the Father. He said that. The Bible says that this father that he was talking about is the creator of the universe. He created all things through his son. That's what the Bible says. So this means that the universe had a beginning. 
The Bible begins by saying in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God, what? Created the heavens and the earth. So the earth and the universe had a beginning, and that beginning, or the cause of that beginning, was God himself. Now this is completely opposite to what the science textbooks say, obviously, and you know this to be true. According to modern science, life itself exists by mere accident. According to modern science, it, there's no purpose, there's no meaning to life as we know it because it was not meant to be. Things just happen. They just eventually fell into place. It wasn't meant to be. No creation, no guidance, no superior intelligence, no destiny, no purpose to life. That's what modern science teaches. There is just nature. No, no divinity, no spirit world. There's just nature. But the Bible presents our beginnings as full of meaning and purpose. God created the world for humans when he created, the Bible says, in his image, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 1 and 2. He created human beings to inhabit, to enjoy, to have completely fulfilling lives. That's what the Bible teaches. He created human beings from nothing. You usually can't get something from nothing, but he created human beings from nothing. Actually, he used, uh, actually, us men, we have a very noble beginning. We come from the mud. <laughs> the Bible says that Eve comes from the mud. We come from mud. So God created the mud and the dirt first, something out of nothing, and then he created human beings from that point on. But he created us to have a relationship with him as a personal, as a loving God. There is meaning to existence. There's destiny. There is a purpose and a meaning to our beginnings and all the way through our own destiny. So when Jesus says, let's go back to what he says. When he says, I am the way, no one comes to the Father except through me. He is stating that life has a purpose and that purpose is an eternal and a happy life. That's, what, that's one of the things that he is indicating by that statement. The Father is real. He's a loving God who will restore this earth someday to its pre-sin beauty and perfection. The Father and the Son are the source of life, the purpose of meaning and of truth. And what Jesus states, what the Bible states, is that you can discover this purpose for your life. You can have a meaningful, fulfilling personal relationship with God. You can have this, but it must be through Jesus Christ. That's what he says. No one can come to the Father except through me, Jesus says. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody goes to God except through me. That's what he says. But some people have problems with what Jesus said. Because some people believe that there are different ways to God. Others don't believe in a God at all, so this is completely irrelevant to them. But for those who believe in a supreme being of sorts, whatever definition they may come up with, with this about this supreme being, not the God of the Bible, there are many ways, there are many paths to God. There's not just one way. There's not just one truth. There's not just one access or door to have a relationship with God to discover your meaning. There may be different ways. So what do we make about this claim of Jesus? That I am the way and the truth and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through me. That he is the only way to God. What do we make of that statement? I want to share three points with you. Number one, Jesus, the Bible says, is God in the flesh. And then later on, after these three points, I want to share with you some things that the Bible teaches about other ways, quote unquote, that many times you may not hear about. So number one, Jesus is God in the flesh. The Bible says in John chapter one, verses one through four, and I'm reading the scripture, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, finish that for me, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him, 
in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is eternal, in other words. He's always been. But he didn't have humanity as part of his nature, of that eternal nature to begin with. When the plan of salvation was being worked out between the Father and the Son, it was the Son, that perfect representation of the Father and nature and substance, who became a human being to live this world like one of us. Born as a baby, had to uh, develop as an embryo and a fetus and to grow and develop in the womb and to be born and to grow and learn just like every human being has to. This is what the Son of God did for us when he came to this world. In fact, the angel Gabriel told Mary that she was to name this word made flesh Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Now, the Bible doesn't present Jesus as merely as an ambassador come to earth from heaven to teach good morals and to live a good life. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that it is God himself in the person of his son that came to earth. This is what it means when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word was God. Although the Father and the Son are separate beings, they are one in divinity, they're one in heart, they're one in purpose, they're one in mind. They are the creators, they are the redeemers of the world. This is what God says. Our fallen world has been eternally linked, in other words. It has been eternally linked by and through Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth are bound together in an inseparable union that can never be broken because Jesus is that link. He is that word that became flesh. And although it's a mystery, the Bible doesn't, the Bible says it, but the Bible doesn't seek to explain it, that Jesus is the God-man. He is all God and he is all man. That's one of the mysteries that we will never understand on this side of eternity nor for that matter, on the other side of eternity. So to gain access to the Father, the very nature of this plan of salvation says that we must go through Jesus. If Jesus is the source of life, if he is the source of salvation, if he is the source of meaning and purpose in life, we have to go through Jesus because he is the word made flesh and he's one of us. The second point I want to mention this morning is that Jesus is life. Jesus is life. Listen to what 1 John chapter 5 says. And this is the testimony. This is the witness. This is the testimony. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And then it goes on to say, He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. So if we want to get access to the Father and to enjoy eternal life and to be in his presence and also understand the meaning of life in the here and now, we must go through the source of life and that is Jesus. And the Bible just blankly and bluntly states, he who has Jesus has life. He who does not, or she, who do not have Jesus do not have life. Now that's talking about eternal life in the long run, but it can also mean the abundant life that Jesus speaks in the here and now. We may be existing, but real life, real living, that can only be attained through Jesus Christ. It can only be granted by one who is immortal and eternal himself, and that is Jesus. It cannot come by mortals, by advanced technology, or any other way. Life can only come through Jesus Christ. So number one, Jesus is not only the Word made flesh, he's one of us, but he's also God at the same time. Jesus is life. The third point I want to bring is that Jesus is truth. Jesus is truth. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus said he is truth. But today there's many truths that abound in our society, in our culture. There's a lot of them. At least that's what's claimed. I'm not talking about natural truths. I'm not talking about the truth that gravity, gravity will pull you down. I'm not talking about the truth that all of you are, are able to hear what I'm saying right now. 
The truth as it is in Jesus is the truth about our world, its origins, its purpose, its destiny, our purpose, and our destiny. What is the meaning of life? What are our origins? Where are we going? Jesus is the source of that truth. If we really want to know what this is about. One day, excuse me, one day a Roman governor, Pilate, asked Jesus, what was that famous question that he asked him? What is truth? What is truth? It's interesting that Jesus didn't answer him. <coughs> excuse me, should have covered my mic. But he said, what is truth? As I said today, there's a lot of truths that abound here and there. Whatever is your truth is your truth. Whatever is my truth is my truth. And that's the way our society um, operates. We call that pluralism today. Whatever is true for you, go for it. Whatever is true for me, uh, go for it. In other words, there is no such thing as absolute truth. There is no such thing as, well, this is the truth and everything else is error. The truth about our origins and our purpose and meaning in life and our destiny. There is no such thing as an absolute truth. In fact, that statement itself doesn't make sense. Did you catch that? If I were to say, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Did you catch that? Well, then what I'm saying is not true. That there's no such thing as absolute truth. Because I'm stating an absolute truth. <laughs> So it's a circular reason. It flies in the face of, of, that, uh, of that sentiment. But Jesus says, I am the truth. Um, today, many people will claim that there are different ways and access to God the Father. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I have a book. I have a book or a couple of books in my office that talk about this predicament. How many of you would raise your hands and would agree that there are a lot of great people, moral people, ethical people, kind people, courteous people, loving people in the world that do not know Jesus Christ? Would you agree with that statement? I would agree with it. There's probably millions of them. I want to invite you to open your books to Romans chapter 2. This is where I said earlier today, I want to share some things with you that we need to take to heart and consider because of what God's Word says regarding... Um, those who may not know the way and the truth and the life. Go to Romans chapter 2. And this is a book written by Paul the Apostle, a letter written by Paul the Apostle. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in chapter 2, and look at verse 14. Chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, for when Gentiles, now in the Bible, Gentiles is a word basically meaning the ethnic races other than Jewish people. So Gentiles can be anybody. can be Romans, they could be Greeks, the Gentiles. For when Gentiles who do not have the what? Law. The law do instinctively the things of the law. These not having the law are a law to themselves. Now let's comment on this for a little bit. This law that the Bible is talking about, that Paul is talking about, is God's law. It's not talking about traffic laws. It's not talking about the Roman laws in this day when Paul wrote this letter to the Roman Christians in, in Rome. It's talking about God's law, the Ten Commandments. And so Paul is saying, for Gentiles who do not have the law, they may not have it in their possession, or they may not be aware of it, or they may have a passing knowledge of it, but they don't know all the minute details. Neither do they, because they don't know all the minute details, they're not saying, well, I obey uh, the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother, for your days shall be long in the land the Lord will give you. But they may not be aware that that is an actual commandment. This is what Paul is saying. It says, but if they do instinctively the things of the law, those things that the law endorses those things that the law instructs these not having the law maybe they don't have it in their minds or physically they are a law to themselves verse 15 and that they show the work of the law written where in their hearts their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or also defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men, and how will he do that? 
through Christ Jesus. So we're saying Jesus is um, is, is uh, the word made flesh. We're saying that Jesus is life. We're saying Jesus is truth. But Jesus is also judge. And how will God judge the world at the very end? He will judge the world through Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is saying is how he's going to judge people. There may be some that don't know about the law. There may be some that don't know about Jesus Christ. But their consciences are still alive. And they are doing and living according to what their consciences say. And what Paul is saying is that that is a law in and of itself. They're doing what their hearts tell them to do. If an individual is not aware that the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother, they didn't know this. They didn't know that, uh, they don't know the story of, of Moses going up to Sinai and God writing uh, his commandments on the tablets of stone. They may not be aware of this. But they may be the best mother and father honoring child that this earth has ever seen. And do you think God will honor that? Or will God say in the judgment through Jesus Christ, uh, I know you were a really good kid. I know you honored your parents. I know you helped them out. I know you obeyed them. But you didn't have the Ten Commandments hanging on your living room wall. So I'm sorry, buddy. You're out of here. You think God will actually do that? No, he won't. So for those who are not in possession of the law or knowledgeable of the law, then God will have to judge the world through Jesus Christ through other means. In other words, there will be a lot of people that will have, have access through the Father, still through Jesus Christ, because that's what the text says. He will judge the world through Jesus. But they just not may be, they may not be aware of it. How many people in this world today are actually obedient to goodness and to faithfulness? and to godliness without even knowing it. So the Bible says here, what Paul is saying is that everybody will still be judged. And everybody will still be judged through Jesus Christ. But God is not so narrow-minded as to use just one means of judgment. Everybody will be judged by the law. But that law will be written on people's hearts even though they may not be aware that it is God's law. This is what Paul is saying here. This, uh, this quarter, we are studying the book of Daniel. We're studying the book of Daniel. And we saw this morning how Daniel and his friends went to Babylon, a very, very uh, pagan uh, culture. They didn't have Yahweh as their main god. Uh, they didn't have Yahweh as their god. They had... What was his name? We learned that this morning. Marduk. And um, in fact, Daniel's name was changed from Bel to Shazar. Bel was another god of the Babylonians. So Daniel's new name reflected the god Bel. And uh, so they went into this culture, into this society that was much different than their own. Much, much different. They talk different, they dress different, they wrote in cuneiform, they, everything was different. Their religious beliefs were different. Their religious beliefs were very, from the Christian point of view, from the Hebrews point of view in the Old Testament, it was very pagan, it was very idolatrous. They had these gods, they would erect statues, and in fact, Daniel uh, chapter uh, 2 is... And three is about a statue and of gold, and they like to have these statues. And they worship these other gods, these pagan gods, which Paul says in the New Testament, they're not gods at all. They think they're gods. But Paul says, I know there's no such thing as gods. But in this world, lots of gods exist. The interesting thing, go to Daniel chapter 4. This is another passage I want to show you. Daniel chapter 4. <coughs> so this, excuse me. <laughs> so this pagan king, in fact, his name Nebuchadnezzar comes from another Babylonian god, Nabu. This pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, was uh, a king who was used to worshiping other gods. 
He was a king that was used to bowing down to idols, as the Bible says, idols that can't hear, idols that can't talk, idols that can't do anything, idols that can't respond. They mean nothing, the Bible says. But this king was used to doing that. That's the way he grew up. That was his custom. That was his practice. This is who he was. But you know what the Bible calls Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king in the book of Jeremiah? Now this may catch you off guard, but God calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. servant. He calls him my servant. And in fact, you know, one of those, and we'll get to Daniel right now, one of those favorite passages we like quoting is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Does anybody know what that passage says? Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I know you, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of, for hope and a future. Well, you know what those words actually are? It is a letter from Jeremiah. It was written about 597 B.C. Jeremiah writes, the prophet Jeremiah writes this letter to his compatriots over in Babylon. Because they have been deported to Babylon, a lot of the Jews, and so Jeremiah is back over there, back at home in Judah. And he's writing this letter. And those words are part of his letter. And the rest of that wording, before and after, Jeremiah actually says, I want you to pray for the prosperity of this place. Pray for the prosperity of Babylon. Pray for its peace. Have kids in Babylon. Flourish. Plant, house, plant uh, vineyards. Build houses. Pray for its peace so that it can prosper. And along with that, you will prosper. That's the context of those words of that promise in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Now why would Jeremiah the prophet say something so blasphemous towards a bunch of pagan heathen people that live in a place where they worship a lot of different gods? Look what Daniel chapter 4 says. In Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And God gives him this dream. Nebuchadnezzar cannot understand this dream. So he goes to Daniel. Daniel interprets the dream for the king. And one of the things that Daniel says is very interesting. In verse 19, we're in Daniel chapter 4, and look at verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him because the king just told him what this dream was. And Daniel is, oh, no, no. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar, which is Daniel, replied, my lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. What Daniel is saying is, king, this pagan, heathen king who bows down to different gods, he's saying, king, I don't want this to happen to you. But where is this dream coming from? It's coming from God. Daniel has the gall to say, I wish this wasn't for you. Now, he's not contradicting God. He's not saying God is wrong. He's not saying God is evil. He's not telling God in this chapter, God, uh, repent and you know, retract from your, your dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He just said, I wish this dream wasn't for you, Nebuchadnezzar. Evidently, Daniel and the king were close. Evidently, Daniel grew to like the king. And he's saying, I wish it was for your enemies, but not for you. But then he has to be faithful, and he interprets the dream for the king. So the king goes out, and the rest of the chapter says that uh, the king really didn't quite abide to the meaning of that dream. And the king got a little bit too proud. He had chance after chance. Now that Daniel was, was uh, a witness in Babylon, and the king uh, just got crazy. <laughs> He became insane, the Bible says, for seven years. Now look at what the rest of the chapter says. Verse 34, but at the end of that period, these seven years of insanity, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes. By the way, this chapter is written by Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Verse 36. At that time, my reason returned to me. Now, look at what God does for Nebuchadnezzar. 
My majesty and splendor were, were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty. Look at that last sentence. And surpassing greatness was what? Added to me. You know what that reminds me of? Reminds me of the story of Job. When Job suffered terribly, that none of us want to suffer like Job did. And at, towards the end of Job's life, the Bible says that God prospered Job even double than what he had before. This is God prospering a pagan king who built a statue and ordered everybody to bow down to this golden statue 90 feet high. This is God prospering this king once he had confessed and repented, God, you are God. Now, Jesus being the pre-incarnate Christ and then... Nebuchadnezzar was having access to the Father through Jesus the Son, or through the Son of God. Just these two stories, I can name many, many more. Let me just mention in passing this one. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, Peter, Peter was a changed man after the day of Pentecost. Before he had denied that he even knew Jesus. In fact, he began to call curses on himself. And in public, he was denying that he ever knew Jesus. He was a changed man after the Holy Spirit filled him. After God's Spirit filled him and he preached a mighty sermon on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 new babies were born that day. Do you know what I mean by that? 3,000 people were baptized. Peter was a changed man. Oh, but almost changed. Almost changed, I said. Because one of the things he had difficulty grasping in his mind, he couldn't quite wrap his mind around the concept that now Gentiles, non-Jews, were being invited into God's kingdom. How could non-Jews be invited into God's kingdom? They don't have the law. They don't have the covenants. They don't have the prophets. They don't have all of these things that Paul describes in, in Romans. They don't have all these things that we do. How could this be possible? How could it be that even non-Jews were receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in different languages, evidence that they were accepted by God? This changed man, Peter, after the day of Pentecost, found it very, very difficult to accept that concept. So much so that even much, much later, he's still having a hard time. And uh, he's asked to go to the house of a Roman guard, a Roman a centurion named Cornelius. And at first, Peter doesn't want to go. Don't have time, but in Acts chapter 10, God gives him a dream. And the way Peter interprets this dream is that he still doesn't understand that anybody and everybody can have access to God. Still through Jesus Christ. But in some cases, in many cases, people will not quite understand, be able to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. They'll not be able to explain all of the scriptures. But as Paul says, but they're following their consciences. What they believe to be right themselves, God can work with that. Do you believe that? God can work with that. Now, when new knowledge comes into play, and we begin to understand more about God's word. Well, yes, the new light is coming and flooding our minds, and we are accountable to that light. But you cannot be accountable to light you do not have. Do you agree with that? God will not hold you accountable to something that in your innocent ignorance you didn't know. God is much more broad-minded than we give him credit for. He is much more enveloping than we give him credit for. So Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is the source of eternal life. He is the source of pure contentment and true joy and happiness in our lives. He is the source of meaning, of purpose in life. He can give you powerful convictions through his spirit about yourself, about your own downfalls, about your own character, but also about hope, about eternal life and a better life than what we're experiencing in this world. That's what Jesus can do for us. And he is working all over the world as I speak. Neighbors down the street here, neighbors up here, over here, the people that live right next door to you, you just do not know. 
We just do not know how God is speaking to their hearts. We don't know. We cannot see a person and say, oh, they're a Gentile. They're automatically excluded from God's kingdom because they're not Jewish like me. That was the apostles' early beliefs. We cannot judge a person by appearance. You can't even judge a person by how angry they get. You don't know their personal battles. You don't know what they're wrestling with. You don't know their history and how they grew up. You don't know the circumstances that shape them into the man or the woman that they are now. But God understands. God understands all of the minute details of when they were growing up and how they lived. The things that they had to confront in life. What shaped their thinking, what shaped their philosophies, and why they talk the way they do, why they believe the way they do. God understands these things. He's very broad-minded, and he takes everything into consideration. Don't you think we should as well? But often, as the apostles did in the New Testament, we would say, if you are not in physical possession of the law, I'm using Paul's wording, if you don't belong to a particular church, if you don't adhere to these particular set of truths and doctrines, then you're a lost cause. But you don't know where that person is in life. You cannot and I cannot play a judge. Now it's a different story once we are in this light, once we are in this information, then you are accountable. Then I can talk to you a little bit more bluntly and say, you know better. But how many people don't know? And yet God is working in their hearts, in their lives, in their consciences. Nebuchadnezzar, why would God choose a pagan king? Why couldn't God punish his people by other means? Why couldn't God send a hurricane and destroy the sanctuary? Why did it have to be done by a pagan king who worships other gods? Why did we have to go captive to a culture and a place that we just can't stand because it's all heathen? God, why couldn't you just send something else to destroy our nation instead of having to go to a new context that we feel very uncomfortable with because the people are just too different than we are? Be careful with how we handle truth. Truth is not meant to condemn and criticize and attack. You know why I know? Because Jesus says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then verse 17, the Bible says, he did not, I did not come into this world to what? Condemn the world, to point the finger. <clears throat> but I came to save the world. That's what truth does. It seeks to save. It seeks to embrace. It seeks to inform. The Holy Spirit is the one that transforms the character. You know, God, Jesus, didn't die for Christians. Did you know that? Jesus didn't die for Seventh-day Adventist Christians only. Jesus didn't come to the world to die for the Methodists and the Baptists. Jesus didn't come into this world to diffuse his truth to only those who already knew the truth. Is that what Jesus did? No. He came to be the light of every man. To love and to serve, and to heal, and to work with, to work with. He came to embrace and to call all nations to himself, his own heart. And in that process, we learn, and we grow, and we understand. But God is patient with us, amen? amen. Do you think you know every aspect of the Bible and God's truth and what God is like? Do you think you know every aspect? Shame on you. You're Christians. You should. That's not the way God treats us. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. 
There is no other way to eternal life and through God the Father except through the person of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. But may we embrace peoples and share his love and his service that he's done for us. The Bible says it's not God's threats. It's not God's judgments. It's not the threat of eternally burning flames in hell that converts people. You know what the Bible says? Paul says this as well as Peter. It is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. It's his kindness. Excuse me if I have gotten in the way of that or any other Christians. But it is God's love, his patience with you, his kindness that leads people to turn to him. That's what softens people's hearts. It's not dogmatism. It's love and kindness that leads people to the Father through Jesus Christ. May we do the same today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We have accepted this truth, some of us, decades ago. Others of us, us fairly recently. Some here have not quite seen that yet and therefore are not ready to accept it. We understand, you understand, but we pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in our lives. We thank you that, Jesus, you provided the way of escape from this world and its temporariness and its fallenness to a much better world, to heaven, to the world made new in perfection and beauty and righteousness. We thank you, Jesus, that you provided all of these things for us. Please continue to love us in this world. Continue to work with us as human beings, Jesus. For those of us who have made the decision to follow you with all of our hearts, for those of us who may have a little bit more knowledge than others, may we use that knowledge, Lord, to attract and to allure, not to repel. We thank you for your promise of your soon return. Help us to continue to share you with others. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.